Welcome to the second West Michigan Lakeshore Solaris Users Group of 2019, quarter two. And thank you for joining me on part five and six, or at least join me for part five. We'll see who comes back about machine design. This is the continuation of the series of starting from scratch in the first session and continuing on. Uh, sessions two through four are available on YouTube online, on all, as well as all the files. So generally, well, I guess it's more than 10 years now, 15 years plus, but quick about me, not that interesting. I hope everybody learned something and uh, raise your hand, ask a question if you have it. And that's about all we have for PowerPoint. So we'll jump into SolidWorks. I did get a new laptop, so hopefully there's no weird things going on, but technically, I think this is the first time I've designed anything on this laptop. So I did just download the files and extracted them. They should be here. Why is that one? Okay, anyway. So I'm just gonna go to my inside of SolidWorks, Windows Explorer, file open. Just rename this a minute. I don't know why I added one there. Open this up, use my top assembly button to show me the top level assembly and then open it from there. So as, <clears throat> I don't, didn't grab a handout, but as the handout said, I'm gonna be going over like guarding, sheet metal, and weldments. <laughs> so some structural frame weldments, some 80-20, and possibly some light curtains and stuff like that. So this is the design as uploaded from before. I don't think I added all the holes and everything because that was a little redundant. I added some of them somewhere. Maybe we'll get to that later. So I'm just gonna start out with a new file and start with a 3D sketch. Now this is how I like to do 3D sketching, right? Of course, there's no universal answer or rule, but I tend to start out, 3D sketching is a little bit different than 2D sketching. You don't have as easy center point rectangles and it tries to do weirder things on planes and whatnot. So I generally do a long hand, I think rectangle probably would have worked as well. Yeah, so the reason I don't like rectangle is because it does perpendicular and parallels in 3D space, which means I can drag down, I don't know if it'll drag well, so I can drag that rectangle on an angle, which would you know really not be desired. So if you manually sketch, why it works this way, I'm not entirely sure, but if you manually sketch all four lines, they sketch along Z and along X as based on our triad down here, which is really what I want. So then picking the origin and this construction line, make that midpoint, and add something arbitrary here, 12 inches. I don't know what the right answer is. We'll fix it later, 36. And then with my, then I can draw my vertical legs. Everybody's familiar with the click and the click. And then if you double click in space, it'll end your chain. So you don't have to come in and out of the command or if you just click and hold down and let go, it'll add that as well. So I'm just gonna quickly add coincident relations to the edges of these legs and look at a normal view, make those equal and connect them. And again, 3D space is a little obnoxious because you gotta draw everything pretty manually because when SolidWorks tries to do it for you, it, it likes to make relations to itself and not orthographic to the design itself. So here we're just gonna define the distance here. I'm just making a, a weldment table say two inches, that might be good enough. Say the legs are 26, sure, whatever. And um, <clears throat> maybe that's good, or maybe we want some more bracing down there. We'll, we'll figure that out later. We'll make some changes. So there's my 3D sketch. In my structural member, we're just gonna pick ANSI standard, and maybe tube square. Let's make this out of two inch by eighth. Now the rule with structural members and 3D sketches is, uh, we're not gonna have too much of an issue here, we'll make some modifications later, but it's usually first to win. So if I want these legs to, to be the ones that are maintained and the horizontals to stop short, I wanna pick my legs first is generally the rule. And then I can do a new group and pick my horizontals to build that structure. Now in this particular instance, I'm choosing to have the legs extend beyond, and then I can put end caps on the top of this if I want you know, through or whatever. Another way to do it would be to have this, these horizontals on top, 
and then put end caps on there for bolting down to the table set. There's no particular right or wrong, I just drew it this way. Um, let me cancel out of that, and I'll just do it the other way just to show you the difference here. So we're just gonna swipe left to right to select only that which was fully encapsulated, and then move these down just so that they terminate at the top of our rectangle there. Oops, one more. And now if I go back into my structural member, I now want the top to win. So if I pick all those first, and it's gonna miter accordingly, and I pick my legs, my legs will terminate against that top structure. Generally, it's first pick win. Um, I don't honestly know what's gonna happen here because this, this is simple enough that it might do something weird or it might behave, I'm not sure. Yeah, see here, so now it extended that leg up to properly trim, which if that's what you want, right, that's the pick order. Um, so it did, it did a couple weird things there, right? The graphics looks like it didn't work right. That was kind of weird, actually. New group. Yeah, it extended it up in the graphics, but when I rebuilt, it didn't work. Oh, now it works. Solid quirks, you all saw it on video. I don't know. Oh, it, it looks like when you pick the entire chain, then they trim, trim back down. So you can pick these little magenta blueberries, I think they call them here, and you can define trim order. And so you can manually adjust things. This interface is really clunky and I don't like it, but you can do really weird things like that if you're trying to do what I have dubbed suicide by machinist, or in this instance, saw. But you can also um, define how this gets mitered which generally if you have to come into this dialog box, something went horribly wrong and you should back up and do it again. Because that dialog box is in an absolute pinch, it's, it's helpful, but rarely is it helpful. So let's do it this way again. Let's, uh, let's say we want our tops mitered. One of the benefits of my previous design where the side tubes go up through is if you're gonna have welded on plates at the end, of, at the end right, that you're gonna tap and bring onto the boring mill, deck off the plates, which we'll do here in a minute, and tap it. You don't have to do any miters. If anyone's ever ran a saw, tried to measure the tape measure and stuff, miters are bad. So in an effort to avoid miters, sometimes I'll take my end legs and extend them beyond and move the rectangular frame down just a few inches. To avoid my miters, I'm gonna have my weld caps anyway. It's gonna be all the same on the boring mill. But, something to consider, but this will work fine. We might change it again later for funsies. Hide your sketch. And so here maybe now I'm going to draw a rectangle there a couple construction lines, and then I can box select and mirror, and then box select and mirror, make those equal. Maybe say this is two and a half inches. Draw a construction line, uh, pick the center of that, make that midpoint. And what did I do wrong? Oh, missed that. Merge those. So with one dimension, a couple center lines and mirroring, I've drawn all four pads pretty effectively. So I'm gonna extrude that up an inch. Because we're in the weldments mode, merge result is not on by default. If I check this on, it'll merge all those bodies, which is not desired in the context of weldments. So I green check, and now I've got my mounting pads for my top plate. Uh, so perhaps I want some tubes down low because that looks a little rickety, no problem. So let's just add, whoops. Let's just add some of this. Dimension it accordingly, six inches is fine. Rebuild the sketch, edit the feature, add a new group, select around, and you get the same result. Because the sketch updates and the feature updates didn't affect these original faces, those features stayed intact. Now if I change this, I should really save this before something crashes. Uh, frame. Now, if you change this two inch tube to three inch or maybe angle iron or you know, round tubing or something, then certainly something is gonna blow up and be very unhappy. But as far as a 3D structural steel tube frame goes, they're relatively easy to draw, quick, re relatively um, quick. And once you have one, you can modify them very quickly by just editing this 3D sketch. So if we jump back to our model now, um, let's just insert this assembly into another one. and every good designer floats the first assembly and mates origins. 
insert that frame that we had. And I'll notice my frame is radically the wrong size, which I really don't care about. I'm going to mate the fronts of that to the front of that plate and the rights. Now, question, trick question. I don't know if it's a trick question, if I tell you it's a trick question. Should I be mating the top of this pad to that plate? No, why not? I said it's a trick question, so obviously the obvious answer is not right. But why would it not be desirable to mate the top of this pad to that plate? Because I'm going to machine it down. Excellent. So let's do that a minute. So I got my, this is my weldment design, right? Now I need a machine design. Or a machined design, as in past tense machined. So perhaps I'm going to make a cut like this, and I'm going to estimate all this is an estimate, right? Take an eighth inch off and do a cut through all. So now all my pads are decked an eighth of an inch. And then here, I'm going to put in a hole wizard. Yeah, OK. And say that it's a standard hole. And it's going to be, we'll say half 13. It's always a good size. Blind is acceptable. All bodies and future scope. And I'm just going to drop one hole there. Same thing as before. Draw a couple construction lines and one across like that. Drag this onto the right spot. Box select the lines and control M, which is my keyboard shortcuts for mirror. Box select and mirror again. Green check, and now I've got four holes. The main goal of all this is no dimensions, right design intent. How can we optimize the geometry to work for ourselves versus having to rekey in the same information all the time? So now if I go back to my new assembly, which I should also save, uh, we'll call this final assembly. Now I can comfortably mate these holes, or the, the tops of these pads that have the holes in them, after it gets done saving. If you notice, I tend to work from the back left to the right and front. So it's kind of like reading a book, right? If you pick up a book, it's the top left that you go down or back left if the book's on the floor. And the reason I do that is because then if I want to change something or pick the original, you minimize your daisy chain connections and it will all rebuild and work faster. So now that this is made in place, if I want to, I can measure the differences from the tube frame. I've got it two inches, but I remember my pads overlap, so this is an inch and three quarters. So perhaps I want to extend the frame. This is what I love about 3D sketching, is I can just click on this. And this is easy math, but pretend it's not easy math. For those of you that don't know, you can do 12 inches plus, parenthesis, 1.75 times 2, end of parenthesis. So you can actually put in any type of math or anything you want. And when you hit Enter, SOLIDWORKS will do the math for you, do the equations, and put the value in there. You can also do. Um, plus like 12 mm if you want to do metric. And it'll do the metric conversion for you and even dump the value in there. So you can do fratrix, metric, standard, any type of standard algebraic equation is all acceptable inside of the um, dimension dialog. What's not, what doesn't work, unfortunately, is in the 3D, uh, instant 3D. I don't think you can do, I think you can do basic math, but I don't think you can do Yeah, you can't do mathematic, or you can't do anything that's with algebraic equations. You can do basic math. So plus, minus, divide. But anytime you're like, you know, this times that by that, it doesn't work. And also, the equations are not supported in instant 3D dimensions. So you have to have the dialog box open to accomplish that. So same thing here. I can measure the outside of that pad, measure the outside of this, and I'm 19 3 quarters. So I'll just copy that for funsies. Double click on here, double click on there. Click plus, paste, times two, parenthesis. And for some reason, it doesn't like inches when you do that. I don't know why. Again, of course, it's easy math, but showing the point here. All right, so now I reevaluate my design. I think that's probably too much for that aluminum plate to span. So I really want pads in the middle. No problem at all. We can open this up, edit this sketch. And in this instance, I'm going to draw another line here arbitrarily in space, right click and select chain so I don't have to pick four individual lines holding down control and mirror that. I'm going to grab this center line and that midpoint and J to make midpoint. 
because my keyboard shortcut. I forget I'm not lecturing to students, so I'm calling out my keyboard shortcuts thinking you guys should pay attention to them, but you're, yeah, whatever. And then mirror that back over. So again, the goal is not to use dimensions. I don't want to redraw a rectangle. I want to mirror an existing profile. I use added one line here just to get it from the far left to the middle. But then to constrain this in the absolute middle, I just used a line I already had and made that midpoint to that bottom line. So when I rebuild, I'm going to get new features. And then I just have to edit my whole wizard. And we can pretty much do the same thing, except a little bit different. I would probably draw a line out here, use this vertical line, make those connected and add a point to there, then take that point and mirror it over from that other horizontal line. The whole wizard now I have to update to, I should have done this originally, all bodies. I thought I did. Why is it not? Who knows? It's because my cut. All bodies. Now it works. Amazing. So now I've got my pads in the middle. So that was 15 minutes. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. Probably. Um, I have a hard time remembering those. <laughs> so or, or, I, it, it does actually follow order of operation. I, I will agree with you on that. Um, I tend to do parentheses because when I'm writing code or in equation manager for building a highly equated model, you tend to have a lots of parentheses and ifs and statements and stuff. And it's absolutely obvious and absolutely readable for anybody that's doing it because not everybody like myself under, understands and remembers the explicit order of operation that mathematics decides to just throw in there and make algebra more fun. <laughs> I was really good with math until they started putting the um, alphabet in there. I don't know. It never really made sense. All right. No, but very valid question. It will follow order of op. That's a standard mathematical practice that SOLIDWORKS does adhere to. Any other questions or comments? Who told you that? Um, Send them my way. I'll take care of that. So you haven't had any issues on your models nope. get larger than this? Nope. So sketch relations are substantially, I would put a number to it, but the number is not going to be exactly right and I'll get hung for it. But I would say an order of magnitude faster than dimensions. Do you go as far as putting in the fillets in the chamber configurations? No. Um, all good questions. <laughs> Just trying to think of uh, how to answer how much time we have. So the reason it's bad practice to put fillets or chamfers in sketching, and from a sketch standpoint, it depends on your modeling practice, but if it's like a, or a, a shaft, you should always use a revolve, right? You don't want to layer cake something um, or do a subtraction method. But generally for a plate like this, look, let's pretend I want a big cutout. I would draw the plate exactly as such, then I'll make another sketch to make the cutout. And the reason is because you never, on standard design, when possible, you never want to have more than one sketch region. You don't want to have to pick sketch regions or have solids figured out. And you also want um, um, separation of concern. So the first sketch builds the plate. That's one, that's one concern. That's one de dedicated separation. Another sketch cuts this big opening hole, right? Um, and if you want to delete that sketch you, or delete that hole, you should be able to click on it, hit the delete key, hit delete absorbed features, and the feature and the sketch disappears. The number one reason not to put fillets or chamfers, unless obviously absolutely necessary, like sheet metal, a bunch of the rules are, which we'll get to sheet metal a little bit, probably next session, but a bunch of, bunch of the rules in sheet metal are totally ignored because you have the, your normal cut profile. So if you have like a rectangle with radius edges that you're cutting through sheet metal, you have to put them in the, in the sketch if you're cutting at an, at an obscure angle, because otherwise if you fillet it afterwards, it's not normal to profile for the laser. So it kind of depends on your environment. There's, a, there's always a have to explanation, but standard practice is no, because you want to be able to suppress your fillets. You best, best practice would be your create features, your subtraction features, any holes, and then fillets in your feature tree. So fillets should always be last. So you can roll up your fillets, do something, and roll them back down. If you're putting in holes and you're dimensioning to the edge of something, you don't want to dimension to a tangent edge of that fillet. So fillets in sketches is, is a very poor practice in my experience and application. Um, in specific to machine design. I have to be clear about that, right? There are industries that I've worked in where we added them because it was best practice and it was desired. But specific to machine design of what we're talking about, sketch relations, 10 over 1 of dimensions, 
especially the same dimension. Um, when I'm lecturing at school or doing homework or um, trying to grade student stuff, if there's two dimensions in the same sketch that are the same, it's 99% of the time an automatic points off. There should be an equal relation. Um, you know, if there's a 90 degree sketch dimension when it should have been perpendicular or horizontal, right? It's, sketch dimensions are infinitely faster. And don't clutter up your screen. Any other questions? It, it, one last quick rant. It's all about design intent. If I change a dimension and the model is symmetric or I've got um, the same, like let's say we're, soon we're going to put a hole pattern in this plate, right, where all the holes are the same offset from the edge. If I change one dimension, I would expect all the holes to move because that's the intent. And if I've got, so there's six holes here, so if you want to go super crazy, you need 12 dimensions for X, Y axis. To have to go change 12 dimensions is insanity. Or doing the equation manager to link 12 dimensions together is just a ton of overhead that's way slow. So we would draw a single sketch with a single, or a sketch with a single dimension and use constraints for everything else. Yes, sir. Quick, quick question, Austin. If you own it, you did it, going to manufacturing, knowing what you're going to touch it. In application where five years later someone yep. picks it up and you never know. Yep. Uh, with Delta Extract added dimensions, would you like these constraints by moving? So I think it's way easier. That's how I teach and that's how I, I consult with customers. The reason why I think it's way easier is because if you have proper design intent, right? And so the, the, there, there's two overall rules in design. Everything will change and everything will break, right? So I understand that things change, right? But, but all things being equal, proper design intent is that anybody should be able to pick up that model, change the dimensions that you have put into that model. The model should update correctly based on intent. So if there's two dimensions, and I want to change my whole offset, I'm going to assume that dimension is for something else, some unrelated thing, or not applicable to my holes, because all of the holes are offset from the edge. It should be a singular dimension edit. Um, and then also, it's, it's a lot more work to go into the sketch, look at everything, delete a sketch relation, and change something. So for the integrity of the model as well, handing it down to the next user or generation or, or designer, right? if you're like, hey, only change the dimensions, and the model should work. It should long term be much better. I just think often of uh, not everyone goes to the same schools we're stuck to. I, I, and, I, and it's the challenge of the mind of what we have. And it is. Multiple disciplines yep. trying to understand something quite the best. No, and, and that's a fair question. So I, I've been at companies before where like every single person did it this certain way. And my advice to them is like, you got to toe the line. Because if you're the oddball, even if you're right, you're not going to get along well. Your, your stuff is going to be totally different. Everyone's going to hate your design. They're going to delete everything you did and redo it. Like, there has to be a certain amount of continuity inside of the company, but that doesn't mean there's not a best practice answer, right? I've legitimately like, told people what you're doing is absolutely insane. I've never before in my life seen that, but it's working. You're, you're being efficient and productive at it, so I can't say what you're doing is wrong, but what I can say you're doing doesn't follow best practices, right? But now maybe for that company, best practices is a different thing. So. Kind of be got got to be a little careful because sometimes I can get uh, excited. All right, so we've got our pads in the middle. I perceive this to be a strong enough design. There's not a lot of um, forces on here. I got my frame. Everything is great. Nobody complains. All right, so as far as that goes, so now I need feet on the bottom. So on the bottom, let's go about drawing. And again, I'm 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 always fundamentally working from back left, right? My pads on the back left, and it mirrors out. Um, many reasons for that, like I was saying, but every time you have a feature dependent on another one, you're daisy chaining something. And especially if you're in a highly configured or mirrored environment, if you're, mirror, if you're doing a lot of heavy mirroring, if you're working on a symmetric design, it's really irritating to have something on the left that mirrors to the right, something made it to the right that is then mirrored to the left, and then you know some hole that's constrained to that which is then mirrored to the right. Um, then you like suppress a bunch of stuff and half your stuff is on the left and half your stuff on the right is all blown up. So if you're doing any, and it, right, I'm right to left because that's how my mind works, that's how I read a book, right? If you maybe grew up in Israel and knew Hebrew, maybe right to left makes more sense to you. Um, but I find left to right a lot more beneficial. So here I'm going to just make this bottom pad the same size as the top by going like this. But I do want extra distance off the edge because I want uh, adjustable jack screw, right? So maybe I'll dimension it from this pad out, or I'm sorry, this tube out. You know, maybe I say, well, I want a square here. So in this instance, I would probably just draw a line from here to here and then make that equal to the width of my pad. Whoops. 
So no dimension whatsoever is needed. And if I put a jack, jack hole in the middle, I'm going to have equal distance on all sides of that pad. Right? So it's aesthetically pleasing. I avoid the dimension. If my tubing size changes, my pad size will change. It's an option, right? So then same thing. I'm going to, oops, that's supposed to be that way. Now, before I added that dimension, if I was smart, I should have um, mirrored it first. I did that the last example. Because if you mirror first, um, this is the only construction line I want to select. Now I can add that construction line that I, and then now I can make that equal. So if, if you have to do sketch mirroring, it's always best to draw your base geometry mirror, then define and put on sketch or put on dimensions, which is what I should have done. So here I'm going to extrude this. This should be an inch. That looks great. And then here I'm going to put in a hole. Uh, probably a clearance hole, honestly. Through wall, position it there. And again here, if I go from here to there, that midpoint, and make those two equal, this hole now is going to be exactly in the middle of the exposed pad, because I went from midpoint, horizontal, vertical, and these two lines are equal. So it's going to put it in the right spot. So again, same thing, a line down and a line over. The reason I draw the line down and over is it's always away from what you're trying to mirror because left to right will only select that which is wholly encompassed. So if I mirror this, I can go two left to rights and select that. If these were any other direction, there's no way for me to start up my original geometry. Oh, I got too many relations there now. Come on. There's no way for me to start at my original geometry and only pick one of those lines. So I always draw lines away from where I'm trying to mirror, do a left to right drag, capture the geometry I want to mirror, and my mirror about line. And I just hit my mirror hotkey, and the sketch flips, and I can do the other way. It's significantly faster. All right, so we green check that. OK, so now I need to send, make a print, send this to manufacturing, and actually build this thing. What's wrong with my tree structure, and what did I do incorrectly? Yes, so we had this best practice discussion, right? Holes are always at the end. So good point. Let's drag holes down. We should always create, remove holes and fillets are the four major order of operations in SOLIDWORKS that we should follow. Any other comments? So um, every, if anyone's done weldments before, you know that SOLIDWORKS always gives you two configurations. Who's found this irritating and weird and annoying? You have no idea why they're there. For the first like five years of my design career, right? So what SOLIDWORKS is doing, SOLIDWORKS says, we know it's a weldment most of the time in the machine design world, right? All of this is contextual. Most of the time, weldments need post-machining. So we're going to automatically give you this post-machining operation. So we've got welded, which is a derived configuration, and machined, which is your finalized configuration. So when it's machined, it's done. When it's um, the derived configuration was welded, it's still in operation. This is very similar to sheet metal, right? The flat pattern is how you start. The formed view is when it's done. So weldment is how it starts, derived configuration. The machined configuration is when it's done. So if we look at and consider this, if I, if I double click and activate my welded configuration, what do I not want in my welded configuration? Uh, be more specific. The surface cut, yep. So I want to suppress this. Whoops, not edit, dang it. So I want to suppress my cut. And when I suppress my cut, what was related to that cut? What was on the face? And then the holes also suppressed. So that's another reason why we always want to cut the face and not just do a configuration change and move it from an inch to seven eighths, because A, configurations admittedly are not as clear. And I am literally cutting it right, it's material removed. And I want to build that face dependency. Any holes or anything else, if I machine in keyways or dowels or slots, I always want those dependencies to be on that cut face so that I've got that parent-child relationship. So you never put in holes in first and then cut. You always cut and then add your holes, dowels, keyways, that kind of stuff. So now I'm going to create a folder, because all good designers create folders when actually applicable. I don't like too many fo folders, but they are helpful. 
And in this instance, I would call it machine features. I'm just going to suppress the entire folder. The reason it was partially suppressed is there were sketches there that weren't suppressed, it only suppressed features. So now I've got machine features. So now is this a good weldment print? Why not? So from a manufacturing standpoint, do I really want to put this on the boring mill to put holes in the feet? So in this context, I would expect to weld those pads on with holes already in them. Because I can, I can prick bunch it and drill it in a drill press and be plus or minus a quarter of inch and nobody cares. The anal QC guy would care. But other than that, right, from a functionality standpoint, nobody would care. Um, especially if, it depends on your, your shop, but I will often recommend uh, rounding this, which I would probably do in the sketch so I can mirror it around just because it looks nicer and you know it's not an ankle killer. I don't like ankle killers, but a lot of shops like to just cut the bar stock and drill the hole, so you'd have to flame cut it or something or have a lot of machining expense. Anyway, so in this instance, when we're going to machine this, I'm going to expect four mounting pads with holes, tubes that are cut on a bandsaw, and then the mounting pads on top that are kind of bandsaw, weld all that together, maybe you know anneal it, stress relieve it, whatever, send it to the boring mill, deck the top, put in the holes, and now I have it, and then maybe paint it or whatever it is after that, and then you're done with your frame. But from a mechanical standpoint, we really want those two configurations. So now as machined, we can see those plates, those pads get decked, and then we add our holes. So we always get these two configurations for free every single time we do a weldment. I encourage you to use them and understand how they're how they're designed to work. So likewise, we're going to select the weldment here and start a new drawing. So now for this drawing, let's drag in the front view, the top view, ISO view, the right view. I always add all of my views first and then play with white space. So that's a little crowded, so let's move this down to 10. Oh, wrong direction. Can't do math. Let's go to 15. All right, so that's good. I can add dimensions and balloons and a cut table. I'm happy enough with that. So on the right view, I'm just going to, I always right click on the view. You can also just go to your tools table. But if you right click on a view, you get tables down here. And we do weldment cut list. Grab that. And oh my word, I have a terrible cut list. The curse of a new computer. All right, so all of this. We're going to delete column. Actually, I wonder if I have a better cut list that I just didn't select. Moment cut list, browse, ha ha, go. That's much better. For some reason, I didn't pick the default. OK. So I've got some missing values here, right? So it knows what all the tube steel is. It doesn't know the length for a couple items. Who wants to take a guess what those are? Exactly. So who knows how to fix that list? Nobody? Wow, you should all learn something now. It's going to be awesome. I'm sorry? Probably have basic preferences. Uh, it's not actually preferences. So the problem is I freehand drew those pads. And SOLIDWORKS has no way to calculate what those pads are. Um, an alternative way to do this, which is not how my laptop is set up, is to have like a flat steel profile and draw a line and extrude a profile, which is also perfectly acceptable. It's a little clunky in some areas, but it helps in others. But here, if I expand the cut list, it'll actually have items in the cut list that are not um, automatically solid driven, which are easily detectable by the folder. So you right click and go to properties. And this is where a lot of the settings come in. So we're going to do, oh no, okay. There's supposed to be properties that would drive that. But here, for description, I'm going to just double click on this pad and say it's two space dash space. And then, whoops, always do the small one first. My bad. One space dash space, then the other dimension, which is two. So now SOLIDWORKS is going to tell me it's one by two. And I could, if I wanted to, I could type something into here like a bar. And then for length, uh, because these happen to be square, I'm just going to pick the exact same dimension again, two and a half. So now if we go back, if I typed those properties, I'm assuming I got it right. Yep. So now I've got a length of two inches of one by two, or length of two and a half of one by two and a half bar. And ideally, that length should actually be on the end. There we go. So any geometric profile that's drawn, you can actually link in and tie in and fill in the cutlass properties. 
So somebody's like, well, SolidWorks didn't do it automatically. There's no way to fix it. And that's just the way it is. My drawing's half-assed and you're just going to deal with it because I don't know. There, there is a way to fix it. Is there a way to get to two decimal points instead of three or it's one decimal point instead of three? Yes, somehow. I don't remember how. I, I, I worked with a customer on tech support on that, and I don't remember what the resolution was. We fixed it, figured out somehow, but I don't remember how. Somebody knows off the top of their head, I'd appreciate the answer. So in this instance, because I don't have this length, um, I'm going to add a read-only driven dimension. I'll just add two of them for funsies to kind of show you how that works. So now I'm going to go to properties here, type in description. And I'm going to say the description, in this instance, double click on this. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, have, or yeah, um, is going to be start with a small dimension first. One space dash space. Two and a half bar is four and three quarters. So now going back to the drawing, that fills in as it should. And now I'm assuming everyone knows how to balloon, knows how to dimension. I'm not going to take the time and do that. We'll do some overalls for fun. Right? And then I'm not even going to bother talking about weld symbols because I've never been to two companies that had the same use, definition, or library, which is really aggravating from an OCD perspective. But whatever, teach their own. There's also a, a rule of thumb on how to dimension weldments. Um, it's hard to get a tape measure to stick to something, so you always do overall, so you can hook it and pull it. So I want from absolute max to absolute max. Right, this, this dimension, as honest and true and helpful as it may seem, will bring unprecedented levels of aggravation to the floor. Because it's really hard to butt a tape measure up to something, get it taut, and measure the inside. So we always want to hook and pull. So quick, quick rule about that. And then, of course, there's going to be um, bomb items, right? So there's item 7, 1, 6. And then we've got the uh, super awesome, I think it was 2017, turn off sketch, uh, mag lines. Really like those. Get all your balloons stuck equally um, spaced. So nice. It's kind of. A bad job anyway, but so nice otherwise. So then here we'll balloon this, this. Unlike the bill of material, SOLIDWORKS doesn't give you good feedback if you have all of the balloons for a weldment. One, two, three, four, missing five. What is five? Five is a two. Yeah, whatever. Um, everyone's familiar with the, with the way to check on a bill of material if you have ballooned everything on an assembly? If you don't know, we got to show it to you because it's so cool. So let's say I have a drawing for this. So, wow, that's a, that's a lot. Let's do uh, parts or top level only. All right. So I add a bunch of balloons to this. All right, just random here. Don't judge me. All right, how do I know if I ballooned everything? Well, you count them, you print it off, you take a highlighter, you do something, you figure it out. SOLIDWORKS has a built-in feature that, for whatever reason, nobody knows about. Um, I've met like two people that knew this existed. So who knows what these little three arrows here do? It's like a fly out to a bomb, right? Which you're like, what is that for? Why would I want to see more information? What it does is it shows you little icons. Are they parts or are they assemblies? When you hover over them, it shows you the actual thumbnail, which is pretty clever. And it tells you what's ballooned. So if you also, if you click on and highlight this entire row, it'll actually highlight that record in the graphics view. So you can be like, oh, I'm missing number seven. Where is number seven? Oh, there is number seven. That's so helpful. The other thing that people don't know about, for whatever reason, uh, this Tisteco clamp. Right now it's telling me it's an assembly. Is it really an assembly? From a bill of material standpoint, is it really an assembly? No. So what do I have to do to make it into a part? No, no. <laughs> ah. All right. So, um, yeah, but, but you lose all your kinematic motion, right? Well, I, I like the Desteco clamp. I like, I don't know if I did it here. 
I like the, the configurations and the kinematic motion. I want to be able to show check clearances, my envelope profile, is it ergonomic for the operator? And these are all very valuable things. But the problem is I want it in my bill of material as a part. Because if I do expand it or a parts only or an indented bill of material now, the DeSego clamp is going to be an assembly, it's going to have children, that's going to be disastrous, right? You can't ask purchasing to buy individual parts of a DeSego clamp. It's a bad thing. So in the DeSego clamp, um, Slightly getting off topic, not that that's surprising for any of my presentations. In the Desteco clamp, or in, in SolidWorks, under the configuration properties of an assembly, you're able to hide, show, or promote the children. If you hide the children, what is an assembly with no children? A part. So I must have hidden the closed position, but shown the open position. And that's what's reflected here in my bomb. Um, Right, yeah, an assembly with no children is a part. So this one is open. So here, uh, I don't know if it duplicated that. Oh yeah, so here I've got two records, DST210U and DST210U, because one's open and one's closed, one's a part, one's an assembly. That's really fun to screw with somebody, by the way. Like, it's a great, great party trick. But from the bill of material here, instead of opening it up, finding the configuration, doing something obnoxious, I can right click only on the image, I think. Yes. Uh, only, if I, only if this is expanded and only on the image can I right click and do component options and pick hide and green check and my bomb will update and everything will rebuild. That 14 is now a part. So instead of opening the part, right clicking on the configuration, going to properties and clicking hide, you can do it from the bomb when this is expanded. Right click, component options, here's the name. You can use the name, the configuration name, or user specified, so I can do something else. Promote, hide, or show, and ignore the quantity. That's very, very bad. I'm not even going to give it credence to say something. So you can change, these are all this exact same, these options are no different at all. Then the ones when you go here, we've got document, configuration, user specified, hide, show, and you can name whatever you want. So it's actually this, this so here's something else. So then change it back to document name, green check, rebuild, close. This particular one, I think the configurations are uh, display configurations as separate items, so display all as one, so there we go. Now they're combined. Slight tangent, but the nice thing with bills and materials will show you what's ballooned. It doesn't show you that in weldments, which is really frustrating, but it is what it is. So a yeah. couple tips there. Yes? I didn't see how you combine Oh, sorry. So if you have a component that has multiple configurations, if yeah. that component is utilizing multiple configurations inside of a given assembly, yeah. then in your bill of material, under part configuration grouping, there's multiple options. I'll make this larger in a minute. There's uh, display as one item number, display configurations of the same part as separate items, which is what it had been doing, so one was 12 and one was 14 or something, or display all configurations of the same part as one item, or display configurations with the same name as one item. So you can kind of group your, you can show something that's open and show something that's closed, and in the bill material it's both the same item, or they can be different items. Okay. That's also a, a, a common gotcha. All right, so back to our drawing. Okay, is this a good weldment print? Everybody happy? Send it to the floor to make parts. What am I missing? Well, this is weldment so far. What am I missing? Well, you got dimensions to the top. Yeah, yeah, there's dimensions missing because I was lazy. Joe has a thought. What? Weld note? Yeah, yeah, so you certainly have weld. I think. Um, I'll say I've never seen anybody use the same uh, weld callouts and stuff, so it's a little irritating. Everybody has their own thing, but it's this this part with the hole. You're not going to get that hole in there by just using that cut table. Uh, yeah. So another oddly not often known thing is there is a hidden feature in SolidWorks. For so if you go to uh, Tools Customize and you look at Commands under the View Layout. Uh, not that. All uh, right, they called this something else. It's called drawings or something. 
There we go. So if you compare the buttons in the view layout, which in, cu in customize is called drawings, for whatever odd reason, they can't name them the same thing, which makes it hard to find. The difference between these icons and commands and those icons and commands, I think, are like three differences. So there's three things they don't, by default, put up there. Um, one is replace to like do a file replace, like a it's like right-click replace in assembly. You can do the same thing in a drawing. But the other one that's significantly more helpful is relative view. A lot of people don't know it exists, and for whatever reason, I mean, you've got plenty of room in the command manager, right? There's so many other tabs that have like double the commands. Why they exclude this, I don't know. But I always drag it up here under my view layouts and click on relative view, and I have to pick on a drawing, and what it'll allow me to do is extract a single body. Uh, actually, I want that to be there. I can extract a single body out of my model and dump it in here. No configurations, no delete bodies, no display states, no theme magic. Just relative view, pick your, pick your view on the drawing, pick your solid body in the 3D view, pick your front and top or right or whatever um, faces, and then insert it in. Now, in this instance, um, I would commonly change the scale to something more helpful. Because part of the reason you do this is because it's so hard to dimension that, right? So here, if we're going to do proper ordinates, uh, keyboard shortcuts, proper ordinates, right? I don't know if I talked about this last time, but what's the right corner to put in ordinates? Top left. And why is that? Because the vice doesn't move, back of the vice doesn't move, and most of the time, if there's a vice stop, it's on the left-hand side. Because the world is predominantly right-handed. So the bill of material for the cut list still works. You can extract out that object. Now, the thickness is in the cut list, but you know, to be helpful, you might want to do that. It's all the same. So this is a pretty good weld print. Are you stretching or have a question? question? Yes, sir. Is that relative view, is that different from uh, using the model views and select bodies? Is that option in there? I don't think so. Um, the relative view, I think, is considerably more powerful. So yeah, you can go frame here, and you can select bodies. Um, the yeah, the difference here is that you don't get to pick the orientation. Right. Okay. I mean, you can kind of pick it here. You, you, you kind of, and then this really falls short if you've got somebody at some obscure angle, which you know happens, because then you're like, you're like projecting it and then doing a projected you know slice view, and you got like five views just to get the view that you want. But yeah, uh, that that works well, especially if you're like embedded sheet metal, which is not best practice in weld, but you can get flat patterns and stuff out of that model view method as well. But I find this feature to be hidden for some odd reason and super helpful, especially in the world of weldments. Any other questions or comments on this so far? OK. So I usually rename my sheets here. And just like flat pattern and formed, right? we start at the weldment, we cut the metal, we drill the holes for the pads, whatever it is. Then we go to machined. So add another tab, add another sheet format. And I can go back here and refresh. And then pretty much we'll drag in a front and a top. It's pretty much all we need in this instance. And we're going to change this here. We can pick configuration. So every, if you have any configured model, this is nothing special to weldments. You can pick a view in your um, drawing. And on top left, you can pick your reference configuration. So I want to reference now the default, which is machined, in green check. And that silly thing pops up. Now on this view, I don't want to also pick machine. I want to pick link to parent. Is why it's not, it's not why that's not a default option. I don't know. It's it should be, but we always want to be able to link parametrically as much as we can. Also in the machine view, I'll generally hide all hidden lines because the boring mill guy doesn't care and it looks confusing. Uh, change our scale to something that is better use of white space management on the drawing, and then generally I'll just add a note here. Cut all pads flat, right? I can't spell. But I wouldn't ever dimension it because if the well, if it's totally out of whack and he has to cut a half inch off, nobody cares. If it's super great and he dusts them and he takes off 30 thousandths, nobody cares, right? So I don't really want to put a dimension in and have them like remove this much material less or more than what's necessary. 
So you could do cut all pads, flat, dust all pads, square pads, whatever is your company nomenclature. And then here as well, I would generally do, um, because nothing is straight, nothing is square, nothing is true on a weldment, I generally do something like this, grab my center lines. You gotta kind of be careful to know what you pick on, right? But pick that, pick that. So you got your center line, center line. <coughs> And call a note out, right? Pick your symbol, center line, it's all great. And then center line the other way. Copy and paste your note, that's great. And dimension this out. You should hole call out. That did not work well. Hole call out. Why is that not working? I don't know. I'll blame the new computer. Don't have time to diagnose it. So we've got something that generally looks like this, right? So we got half 13, six. I really don't know why that's not working. Half 13, six times. Uh, we gotta cut that off. That's your machine print. So they're gonna find center lines. I'm not even gonna give them the dimension of the edge of the tube or ordinates, because that's not how boring mills on weldments work. So here's center lines, find center, so they're gonna you know, edge find, edge find, or you know, tape measure and sharpie, because that's all anybody cares about. And then they're gonna take 77 and a half, half of that one direction, half that the other, 15 and a half, half each direction, dump, it, dump a hole in the middle, everyone's happy. Police the center line a little bit, kinda got out there. That's the weldment that I promised. Any questions on that? So again, I would give this print off. The first sheet, ideally we'd print them off and staple them together or something. The first sheet goes to the saw guy. He cuts it all, maybe brings it to the mill or the drill press guy, right? We jump a hole in it, goes to the weld guy, we weld it together. And then the second print, which we should rename to machine print, I suppose, to be consistent. Print. We're going to deck it, drill it, then it's going to be painted, and that's not geometric, that's custom properties. But So we've got a print, got a weldment, made it into our assembly in just under an hour. Print's kind of half-assed. Any questions? How do you transfer the holes in this place? Aha! Uh -huh. So because this is a like custom machine design, we'll call it right, where it's a one-off, I would be more than happy to do an external reference. So I would just grab my hose. I think those are half 13s. So let's grab our socket head cap screw of a half inch through wall. OK, so here you're like, oh, you got to find that. So we're going to right click, select other, select other, select other, pick the edge of my hole, pick that, make it coincident, right? Who does that? Nobody? What do you guys do instead? Wireframe, thank you, sir. So we do wireframe and grab a point. We just hover over the edge and drop it in the middle. Hover on the edge, drop it in the middle. Hover on the edge, drop it in the middle. Now, because I am fundamentally against external references, except for when you use them, and that is a thing. Um, I would probably now go in here, because I know this is all mirrored, and like mirror this over. If I want to be really anal, then I would, um, again, delete this, take these two and mirror it about there, run this. Uh, mirror that over, run this up to there. Run this over to there. And this is just to minimize my liabilities, right? So now I have a singular external reference because what always happens in design, something and something breaks, right? So the worst thing that's going to happen is one hole is going to fail. If I fix that one hole, proper design intent. Again, this all is based off symmetry, right? My origins are in the center. My holes are evenly spaced. Everything is centered, right? From a symmetrical design, this works very well. 
In this instance, I don't ever see it not being symmetrical, so it's a very, very safe bet. But if you were working on product design, Joe lives in a world where external references are not allowed lest somebody get shot. So you would have to construct things differently and dimension it accordingly. Um, Fog Filler Company does not allow external references, but many of my other customers do. So depending on what environment I'm working on, I will or will not use external references. In the instances where you can't use external references in production, you can still use it in design. You just have to break them all, constrain them properly. And sometimes that's a lot easier because you have your, your base, everything is external referenced on top of that. Then when you break them all, you can go back and add the same dimensions in the same place the same way. So I would logically want the dimensions in the upper left-hand corner dimensioned the same way in all instances. So if I do need to make a change, I can make the consistent change in all three parts or 10 parts or 20 parts. Um, so external references are okay, always in design, sometimes not in production, and you just have to keep that in mind. But even when they are allowed, I still like symmetry, I still like mirroring, and I still like limiting my liability because something will blow up. Any other questions? And I would say that has this limited extent, like these that are on a weird angle, just transfer all four of them because it's a weird angle. And there's no easy way to constrain that otherwise. So there are, there are limitations to that. Any other questions or comments? I think we're out of time, but they're still going, so that means I can keep going, right? Well, let's see how far it's been recorded. All right. So let's do a little bit of sheet metal real quick. Let's say I need a reject bin on the bottom. So as soon as SolidWorks gets done saving, we do a new file. And on the front view, draw some. Draw something that looks like this. And make those equal. Make this line horizontal. Dimension this as an inch. Maybe this is supposed to be 12. And maybe my angle here should be eight. I don't know. Make it. So then in sheet metal, if you're not using gauge tables, always use gauge tables. Uh, let's say 12 gauge is sufficient. 12 gauge is sufficient. Let's try that again. And I just got to pick what side, right? I mean, it's a reject bin, so it doesn't really matter. But I'm going to move it, you know, move it to the middle and say, what was the frame? 17 inches. Something like that. Save. Uh, reject bin shelf. Now, in the world of sheet metal, who uses fillets and who uses corner break, corner trim? Fillets. Corner break, corner trim. <laughs> All right. So corner break, corner trim is one of those really frustrating features because it sometimes works super well and other times is craptastic. So in this instance, I hope it's going to work super well. So if I do corner trim, corner break, uh, let's first start with a chamfer, and let's call it a half inch. I can just pick on these two faces, and it'll pick every corner that'll touch and work, which is super helpful. Launch the command a second time. Let's do a fillet of a quarter of an inch. Pick this as well. Look at what it gave me. So unlike fillet, I only have to pick faces and it'll trim corners because it knows it's sheet metal, right? That's the whole point of sheet metal. The other thing that corner break, corner trim will do is I can't pick the wrong edge. It's impossible to pick this edge. And in a fillet, you can fill at that edge, right? On a fillet here, I can pick this edge and it'll wrap all the way around. Right? Give that to your laser operator. <laughs> See how long he, he stays your friend. So fillets are pretty dangerous because you can literally, literally click the wrong thing and it will be the wrong thing. Um, corner break, corner, break corner, corner trim, that's not hard. Um, it will not let you pick the wrong thing and likewise if you pick a face, it will pick the corners for you. So it's a huge time saver. There are certain instances typically inside corners and profiles and obscure outside corners and profiles that it just simply doesn't recognize because it's like too smart of a feature you can't overwrite like, I don't care what you say, you're going to put a radius on this. It'll just say like, no, that's not allowed. And then you have a mixture of like corner break, corner trim, break corners and corner trims. Such an oddly worded thing. And um, fillets. And then you got that mixture and that's never good either. So it's, it's a frustrating, super awesome when it works, kind of frustrating when it doesn't. So let's go over here. We'll pretend this is going to be bolted on there somewhere, somewhere, shape or form. 
If it was welded, I guess I should quick rant about this a minute while I've got the time. If it was welded, I would build an assembly. Wow, that was way off. Uh, I can't use that one, that's right. The front is not the front, so I'll use the front off the frame. Ah, so close, look at that. So if these two were welded together, I would wanna create an assembly, put the frame and the sheet metal in assembly and weld that, and then put the assembly into the model. We don't ever mix sheet metal and tube frame because they're different methods of manufacturing. We need to send a blank to sheet metal or to the laser, we gotta get a break bent, and tubing is totally different. So weldments generally work well if it's common methods of manufacturing, the holes in these and the boring mill, right, is acceptable inside that range. Sheet metal, I would need a different print, a different part number, a different flat pattern. All of that is not consistent or compatible with this design method. So multi-bodied is fine as long as it's a consistent manufacturing method. Um, anything else in that, you want to combine it at an assembly, weld it all together, and then put that assembly into your, into your model. Any questions or comments? I think my time is up. Maybe. He's still going. While he's doing it. Uh, so at some point, a parent's going to come in here and tell me i got to behave. So. Uh, any questions? That's kind of what I had for weldments and a little bit of sheet metal and the configurations and the prints. Next session, should you so choose to come back, we're going to do guarding on top. So it's going to be 80-20, still similar weldments, but a couple, again, unique twists to it. Who works with 80-20? Who loves 80-20? Who thinks it's frustrating in a model? So I'll show you the tricks that I have. Um, hopefully, it'll help a little bit. And it's probably some more uh, sheet metal, some light curtains, other fun stuff. Yes, sir? Yeah, it's a simple base for when it gets beyond simple. Very creative, <laughs> a lot of non symmetry, mm -hmm. uh, some part of it. So, my question was do you ever mix the two? Do you start out in the building of, let's say, a base that uh, you do a bunch of symmetry and mm -hmm. quite a bit to like on a 3D sketch? How do, you, how do you go about that process of kind of a. Yep, so like, like let's say I needed some uprights here for electrical cabinet or something that was non symmetric, right? Then sure. you would just have to do what, do what you have to do, right? This is going to be 16 inches. This is going to be eight, 18 inches, and such is life. I mean, it, it is what it is, right? If, if, if those are the design requirements handed to you, and there's nothing you can do about them, then there's nothing you can do about them, and that is what you get. Just, just curious yep. the process, you know, like you go a certain way through your model, and then you build the rest of the non symmetry stuff later. I, I would I would probably draw that connection more at separation of concern and um, separation of concern and design intent requirements than symmetry and not. Okay. Not not that you couldn't do that or you could have a 3D sketch and put in a couple 2D planes or do some 2D sketches or something, but I'd probably draw the line more on separation of concern and design intent over symmetry or not. But yeah, whatever works, right? The the main thing anytime you're doing structural tubing, you really want a singular 3D sketch. Um, because you can constrain all that together. And in SOLIDWORKS 2019, they recently added, if anybody, ha if anybody does a ton of weldments and you find the structural member tubing or structural member feature lacking, SOLIDWORKS recently in 2019 came out with structural systems, which is weldments on super steroids. I've not technically needed to use them yet because my weldments are simple enough that it works. But if you use a lot of weldments and you find them frustrating, check out those features, they're weldments on steroids. All right, I'm being told by the adult I have to stop, so. There you go. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Uh, I should probably quick throw up my last PowerPoint slide to be professional. Here's contact information. Thank you for coming.